great thing about having a compass is you always have a point of reference. Hi, my name is Tola Ray and I'm an Eagle Scout candidate here at Hallfields Presbyterian Church in Mebane, North Carolina. My Eagle Scout project is to modernize the history of Hallfields digitally. These living libraries of memory that members of the church congregation and community have may be forgotten without documentation. The church has played a major role in the development of the area since the 1740s. It was the epicenter of growth, birthing some 20 churches. Hopefully this video is more interesting than books and historical sketches as people don't read as much anymore. We should know our roots, and after all, the deeper the roots, the stronger the branches. This is my Eagle Scout Project documentary. I hope you enjoy. In first looking at why people migrated here, we have to look at the explorers that came first. In 1701, the explorer John Lawson came down. Concluding his visit in 1709, he wrote a book called A New Voyage to Carolina. This is the current historian at the Alamance Historical Museum. He can explain this further. My name is William Vincent, Bill Vincent. Uh, I'm the director of the Alamance County Historical Museum and I also teach anthropology for Elon University. The contemporary existence of Hall Fields can certainly be traced back to the time frame in the mid 18th century and about that time you were finding lots of immigration into what were, was then the colonies um, and many of those immigrants came uh, into the port at Philadelphia. It was not long after that 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 area around Philadelphia and Chester County uh, became basically inundated with these people who were largely coming from both Germany, particularly Bavaria, and the area of England and Scotland and Ireland. And those um, people were finding great difficulty uh, establishing land in that particular area. In fact, they began to look to other locations where they could move and uh, then uh, establish settlement in that way. And as I said, this Native American trading path read, led right down from area of central North Carolina and it led right up to Chester County, Pennsylvania. So it was a likely route um, for them to try to take to come into this area. The Haw River is one of the most significant parts to this area. It serves as a drainage point as North Carolina has a fault line that leads to it. Bill Vincent can talk more about this. The word Haw is probably a Siouan Indian language word and it basically means uh, Indian. So you would hear in this area Sisapaha, Saxapaha, Altamaha. It refers to the various Indian groups that were living along the Haw River, along this uh, river that uh, you know, would have been translated as sort of the Indian River in that particular time frame. In 1701, the explorer John Lawson came through this area. Um, he actually had started off in um, Charleston, South Carolina, came up the Santee Cooper River going basically west, crossed into what is uh, now North Carolina, uh, near what is present day Charlotte, North Carolina. In fact, Trade Street in Charlotte um, is known as Trade Street, not because it's now a financial center there, but because it was where the trading path was. And he then uh, turned and began to come east, and he followed these roadways right through here, uh, came right to what's now Hillsborough, North Carolina, where he encountered the major um, uh, Suen town at that time uh, frame, and uh, then eventually traveled uh, east and uh, traveled on to um, the uh, area of coastal North Carolina. But in the course of doing that, he was very impressed um, by the local land. He said that um, this was some of the most arable land that he had found um, in traveling. Uh, he said that uh, a lot of the area had already been cleared by the Native American population who were partially horticulturalists and so they had cleared land um, uh, for that purpose. So he said if you come down here you won't uh, have to spend an inordinate amount of time clearing land because it's already been cleared. Lawson claimed that 
from an agricultural standpoint. The land that he found in this area was as rich as the Nile Delta, which is a bit of an exaggeration, I think, but that's what he says in his book. And so settlers were enticed by that. They, they knew that um, down here the growing season was relatively longer than it was um, in the north and that uh, various kinds of crops would grow here, everything from great soil here for grain products, for instance, this red soil is really a good soil that you can grow um, corn and wheat and barley and things like that. They uh, recognized that. Then uh, they were beginning to learn about access to a number of Native American plants that uh, traditionally had grown in the area, including tobacco, which of course in the 19th century would become a major cash crop in the um, local area as well. Shortly after his visit here in 1701, he published a book um, called A New Voyage to Carolina. And that book circulated all over the colonies and particularly was available in Philadelphia and so forth. So many people had access to that book and it was an inducement to begin to move down into this area. So the um, people began to filter into this area mainly by the 1740s um, and um, they established themselves in an interesting pattern that was, they were sort of united by ties of religion and ethnicity and interestingly enough mainly the Scots-Irish um, settled on the eastern side of um, the Hall River near the present-day town of Mebane and in that general area um, and that's because they got their land grants from contractors who were selling to them and these were primarily Scots-Irish uh, individuals that they got their uh, land grants established from. The Germans all settled on the western side of um, the Hall River. So all this area out here where the museum is located was all Lutheran territory. They were German uh, Lutherans for the most part and that's why we see so many Lutheran churches all up and down Highway 62, um, St. Paul's Lutheran and all the other ones that are in the area. So and, and those distinctive settlement groups would remain very much that way until after the Civil War. In other words, they were very endogamous. There was not a lot of intermarriage between the Germans and the Scots-Irish and so forth during that time frame. That would change somewhat after the war, but uh, all the names that we hear, for instance, out in this area um, are German-derived names. We have Sharps out here. They were originally Sherbs. Um, we have uh, Fogelmans. That was originally Vocalman, Angel Man. Um, we have um, um, lots of Kobels, and they were originally Koppel, like Fred Koppel on TV. Um, and so that would remain very much the uh, same. And out in this area, if you go to cemeteries at many of these Lutheran churches, you will see that the script on many of the early tombstones is German script, and oftentimes their church records were kept in German out here until about the mid-1800s. But it was very different over on the other side of the river. And for the most part, they were uh, of Scots-Irish heritage. And certainly um, that um, Scots-Irish heritage, and they were Presbyterians for the most part. And uh, that would result in the creation of Hallfields Presbyterian Church um, very early on. Another reason the area may be attractive to new settlers is how open it is. Here's what Benny Covington has to say about this. Um, Benny Covington, um, originally from Hallfields. I've been away for periods of time, but not not too long at one time. See, when they came, early settlers here tended to connect themselves with Hillsborough more than back this direction or of course Graham didn't even exist nor Burlington so yeah. uh, there was a draw in that direction sort of but eventually uh, people uh, got to moving around more and settle more uh, this area right here was uh, a, a very good area to settle in because uh, there were trees available but there was also open land available now, that brings up a whole question as to how that came about, and we actually don't know. My guess is that at some time, way back, there was a big fire and burned over this whole area right here, say from uh, between Alexander Wilson and Mebane, and between Hall River and uh, toward Eflin, uh, because it was a 
section here that the topography and all was entirely different. Uh, there were grassland, there were uh, berries growing that animals could eat, that kind of thing. Whereas if you started toward Chapel Hill, you ran into a whole lot of undergrowth. Uh, it was almost impossible to walk through it, you know. It was a long time before there was a road or way to travel, say, down where 54 is now. That That's a relatively new road uh, because it was so hard to get through there. Okay. So uh, that's about all uh, we know about how that actually happened. What I do know is that, um, as I said, John Lawson reported seeing um, many of the native peoples clearing land and so forth for their agricultural uh, purposes. So I think largely those that cleared land that we refer to as the Hall Fields or the old Hall Fields um, was as a direct result of their activity. Now, I can say that um, when I lived and worked in South America, the Indians in the upper Amazon um, clear land in uh, something of that same pattern. They will go into an area and clear down uh, what brush that they can manage easily to chop down. The large trees they largely leave standing and then they set fire to the area and that fire is important because it helps to add potash to um, the ground um, for fertilizing purposes. The fire eventually burns a lot of the trees and causes it to have relatively open space so that the plant life would get enough light to, to grow. So it may have been a combination of all that. Maybe, you know, they set some fires and they, they became essentially a forest fire and, and helped with that. But I think largely it was as a result of the activity of the Native Americans that the land was, that was cleared. Okay. There were three locations of the church. This being the first, in 1755, heavily inspired by Huey Caden's visit, the church was organized officially. The church owns about an acre or so of this land. Many people will be confused when I say this is the first location because it's just right beside a candy factory in the middle of nowhere. Plus, its name on Google Maps is the Hawfields Haunted Forest. But that's actually a Civitan project at the current location. In October, they fundraise by scaring people and you go through the woods. As we look around, we'll see a couple of rocks and they may just seem like rocks at first, but they're actually tombstones. They have been weathered down so much that we can't even identify the people that were buried there. If we walk around, we'll see some tombstones. Like this one right here. That one is too. See right here, there's I-85. This used to be the Great Wagon Road. Bill Vincent can explain this further. Most of the Indians in the local area spoke variants of Siouan dialogues. These Indians came over the North Carolina mountains in the 1400s. They uh, largely supplanted uh, an earlier woodland population that was living in this area. In so doing, they established themselves as the primary uh, language group here in the area. And their languages are related to the languages that we would have seen out in the American uh, West and Midwest. Uh, the Indians that we were properly think of as Sioux, like the Dakota and the Lakota Sioux. If you ever saw the movie Dances with Wolves, they were Lakota Sioux that were being depicted in that particular movie. So they established themselves here very early on, about the time that uh, Columbus was coming to this part of the world. They eventually established a network of trading paths that led from this Piedmont area of North Carolina all the way up to 
uh, Chester County, Pennsylvania, and uh, it would be along that uh, uh, Indian trading path, as it was known then, that eventually would become the Great Wagon Road, and that Great Wagon Road was the route that most of the early settlers uh, followed in coming to this area of um, Piedmont, North Carolina. And that wagon road is 40 now? Part of the wagon road is sort of Highway Interstate 40, and part of it is uh, Interstate 85, and Highway 70 follows very closely around, along that area as well. No one really knows who preached between 1755 and 1764, but Hawfields was organized in 1755. The first recorded service was August 24th, 1755. There were so many Scots-Irish Presbyterians in this area that in 1765, um, Henry Patillo, who would be the first uh, minister at um, uh, Hallfields, would petition the uh, Synod um, up in, which then was located in Philadelphia and in New York, to establish uh, a, a Synod and a Presbytery here in the um, local area. He became the first minister at Hallfields, and not only was he the first minister there, but as you probably are aware, um, they did not have church services every Sunday at all these churches. So he would be sort of a traveling minister to some extent, and it was uh, his association with other Scots-Irish Presbyterian congregations in the area that would result in the eventual creation of Crossroads Presbyterian Church, which is just north of Mabbitt, and Stony Creek Presbyterian Church, which is um, north somewhat between uh, Burlington and the uh, area of what we would call Pleasant Grove um, today out in, in that um, particular area. So we can consider how feels to be the mother church of Presbyterianism here in the um, local area. In 1770, I think, the Synod um, created Orange Presbytery I think it was created on, on September the 5th of 1770, and we still have Orange Presbytery here in the uh, community today. Fact check. Orange Presbytery was actually disassembled in the late 80s. A.B. Plexico was the present minister when that happened. Here's what he had to say. Well, I am uh, uh, A.B. Plexico. I was born in Sharon, South Carolina. Uh, I'm... Uh, 86 years old. Uh, I came to Hall Fields as in my, it constituted my third pastorate. Incidentally, your grandfather was on my pulpit committee and came to hear me preach and consequently was a part of my coming here as pastor in February 1972. So October 25th, 1988 was the last meeting of Orange Presbytery? We were called the Old Orange. That was the <laughs> traditional name in this area. And it was a very proud presbytery because it was the largest presbytery in the denomination. Now we're talking about the Southern the, uh, Presbyterian Church, U.S. Back then we just called it quickly the Southern Church and the Northern Church. And you know, now we are reunited after many, many years. Orange Presbytery disappeared in that uh, reuniting of the uh, Northern Branch and the Southern Branch of the Presbyterian Church. And uh, that was with a lot of uh, sadness for we who were in the Orange Presbytery. Because when you're the largest Presbytery in the General Assembly, they they recognize uh, the importance of that church body. The General Assembly does, you know. And so we were very much a part of the Senate and the General Assembly. We lost the honor of being the largest presbytery in the General Assembly. But Salem Presbytery has worked well during my years of, of uh, membership in it, you know. And, I, as a minister, a lot of people don't know this, I am not a member of Hallfield Church and I cannot participate in the congregational meetings or vote or anything like that because my membership as a minister is lodged in the Presbytery. I'm a member of Salem Presbytery. Of course, my family is a member of Hallfields, uh, uh, the girls and Lynette.
Your minister can probably tell you more about how the presbytery functions within the larger governance of um, of, of um, all fields and of the Presbyterian Church uh, at large. In 1775, a man by the name of John de Beau came into this area. He was of Dutch heritage, I think, and. Um, he became the next uh, minister, so to speak, of all fields. And during his ministry, the, the church was located from its original site, which was over near the Ben Wilson farm. And there was just a brush arbor there initially, and ultimately there was a lot of structure in that location. But in the 70s, 1970s, John Dubot um, convinced everybody to move the church to its present day um, location. And he's also, I think, the first person to be buried in the new cemetery that's located at the present day Hallfields Church. And other interesting things, um, in the eight, early 1800s, Hallfields became the center of a great revival movement. Um, here in North Carolina uh, called the Great Awakening as it was referred to and it was largely an evangelical um, movement. It also um, was centered at Crossroads Church as well and um, there were various kinds of um, camp meetings so to speak that were uh, held at both locations and in fact at uh, Crossroads there was a camp meeting at which a number of the congregants began to speak in tongues and um, that sort of thing. So it resulted in the um, beginnings of a revivalist movement here in the uh, local community and that would last um, for a number of years and even into the mid-1800s camp meetings at both Crossroads and Hall Fields were something that uh, were attended by many people, not just um, uh, people of, um, not just Presbyterians. For instance, the Holtz who live in, lived in this house, there are many references in their diaries to going to camp meetings at both locations, all fields and crossroads. I think uh, Mr. Holtz's daughters professed their faith at one of the camp meetings that was held at um, uh, all fields. This was around the declaring of our independence in America. Much of the present constitution in the United States was inspired by the Presbyterian government style. In fact, 12 out of the 56 signatures of the Declaration of Independence were of Presbyterian men. Keep in mind, the United States Constitution is the oldest document to represent a country's laws that is still in place currently. More on this from David Ely, the 26th and current pastor of the church. One of the major differences between denominations, right, is how they're governed. Mm -hmm. So in an Episcopal system, bishops kind of rule the day. They direct where priests go. They basically um, command how churches are organized. And so in the Roman Catholic Church, the chief bishop, of course, is the pope. But then you have archbishops, you have, you know, the head of diocese and that kind mm -hmm. of thing. And in a local church, the priest basically rules all. I mean, all decisions go through them and so on. Um, the Episcopal Church is the same way actually, in a lot of ways. In a Baptist church, they're actually more similar to a Roman Catholic church than they probably like. But, you know, the pastor, again, is in charge until he does something the congregation doesn't like, and then the deacon board <laughs> steps mm -hmm. in. In a Presbyterian church, and it's the name Presbyterian, as weird as it may sound, actually comes from the Greek, presbyteros, which means elder. It's set up to take seriously a couple of things. One, um, that in order to discern God's will, then we need to do it together. The other thing um, that is a part of our conviction is that since we are all sinners, um, no one person has a monopoly on what God has to say. And so, again, we have to do that together. Um, and then the third thing is that we only have one bishop, and that's Jesus Christ. Christ alone is the head of the church. And so all of us really are servants. In our local church, um, there are a lot of things that I'm responsible for as the pastor, but I'm considered an elder and I am a member of what we call the session, which is basically the board of our church. And the session and I, we are all elected by the congregation. And it's confirmed by the presbytery, which is a you know grouping of churches. Um, our region happens to be called Salem. Where it gets to be similar to the way our United States government is organized is because we elect our leaders. Everybody in Congress, the president, we elect all those folks. But unlike Congress, 
or the president for that matter, where they're supposed to be beholden to the voters, you know, their constituencies, all the citizens, um, our constituency is Christ alone. So even though the congregation votes for us and puts us in office, um, we don't really answer to them. We're supposed to answer to God. Now, let's be real, right? Mm. If I do something that the congregation doesn't like, um, that can cause a lot of trouble. And, you know, form of government aside, you know, probably won't be here long. But at the same time, the way our government is structured is set up to protect us from having to deal with mob rule. So in other words, if we feel like God's moving us in one direction, but everybody just doesn't like it, that's not a reason to not do that because we're supposed to be following God's direction. Um, okay. So anyway, that's how it works. In 1780, the second location was erected. Not much information has been recorded on it and it's been since torn down. Near the granite marker given by Mr. and Mrs. B. Frank is the grave of Mr. Henry Cook father of Mr. E. M. Cook, who was once superintendent of the Virginia Cotton Mills at Swepsonville. Mr. Cook had requested that his remains be interred where his pew laid. This is where it is. Can you tell me about like the different styled buildings over time? So I understand the first one was just a roof of leaves. Yeah, first one was uh, what they used to call a, a bush arbor. Um, essentially it was some post with a little frame on it with some uh, limbs with leaves. I think just mainly to protect you from the sun. I don't see how it would have helped any in cold weather. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe shade was the main thing. And then they built uh, uh, a couple of, there were a couple of log buildings. And then of course the san current sanctuary. It was purchased for $5,000 from Mr. John Anderson. It was built from 1852 to 1854. And it was originally just the sanctuary. The the Sunday school rooms were added on uh, about 1920. They did a good job of matching it up and all, but if you, uh, somehow if you go up in the attic and all the, the new part of it wasn't as well constructed as the original part, as in my opinion, you know, so, yeah. so but uh, mm -hmm. it's it stood there all this time anyway. Now, you realize, of course, that the brick for that building came from over here where the elementary school is. They, they dug up the red topsoil, and, of course, they used the term fired them. That means they baked them to make them hard. And uh, when they first built that school, they were having trouble getting the grass to grow. And I told him, I says, well, the reason you can't get into grass, the topsoil is all over, over in that building. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, it's Hall Fields uh, Elementary and Middle School, right uh, down behind okay. the store there. Okay. Yeah. It served whites and blacks, as it was the tradition to worship together. At one time, the slave membership numbered 50. Ivor Freshwater has found a picture of the slave entrance from another church's bulletin. Here it is right now. They took, had an entrance for the slaves come in here on this side of the building up here. Okay. And they used to sit at the top, right? And they sat up in the balcony. As David explains, they are the cheap seats now. Over, you know, 1755, that's a long time, right? And so the, this church saw a lot of changes, um, none the least of which was the Civil War, the Civil Rights Movement, and so on. Um, and predating that, of course, this church had to deal with the subject of slavery. Um, we even have pictures in our historical room of this church that show the slave entrance to the sanctuary. Um, the balcony in the, in the sanctuary was set up to be the slave gallery, and the conviction was that we all needed to worship in the same place. Because, you know, when I first got here and I saw it, I thought, Oh, great. <laughs> the slave gallery. But, I mean, it really was kind of phenomenal because mm -hmm. um, for a lot of the churches in the South, you know, the, the common practice was to have them in their own space. Um, but because of the conviction that we all need to be worshiping in the same place, they set the gallery up. 
Um, eventually, of course, that entrance got closed up. And now, nowadays, they call that the cheap seats. And, you know, any old body can s sit up there. Um, in particular, some of the youth, but that's a recent phenomenon. Mm -hmm. You know, there was a time where men and women were, were to worship separately. There was a divider right up the middle of the sanctuary. Um, and it was there for a long time. In fact, if you go to Old Salem... You can see a church there that still has one. It's kind of interesting. But at some point, if you read the minutes, it's kind of mundane. They were like, you know, this is dumb. We're going co-ed. And so they did. They removed the barrier. Then we started worshiping. Men and women didn't matter what side they were on. Those things seem small. But, I mean, those were deliberate decisions that kind of smacked in the face of the current conventional wisdom of the day. And so, in some respects, this church was really kind of a pioneer. And that's, that's a lot of the history of the Presbyterian church in this country. They're, they're kind of slow pioneers. Um, they're not necessarily going to be on the cutting edge, but once they do get in the fight, um, they're in all the way, and they are a juggernaut. You know, I was looking through the membership books, especially the older ones. And, you know, of course, <laughs> you know, was reading, you know, about one of the pastors here and it's you know of course lists him lists his family and then it lists his slaves right and i remember looking at it i thought oh, that's great you know yeah but then it occurred to me why list the slaves and there was john jake and and nancy patillo the children then there was the table that belonged to the patillos this chair and this horse you know, none of those things were in the book they were property. And yet their names are in the membership book. Mm. So, you know, whatever we want to say and, you know, whatever lens we want to apply from our, you know, 21st century mindset to theirs, when we look through their lens, I don't know. I think they were really pushing some of the edges. Hawfields was a leader in change. According to the letter in 1842, there was a part of the west end of the newer framed house that was sectioned off for the blacks. In 1860, there were 224 communicants or members of the church. In 1880, there were only 184. This was caused by the Civil War and the increase of blacks being members. This is where the slaves were buried. There were no tombstones, unfortunately, and this is the marker to pay respects to those who lie here. Show how there's no stones in this area. Hawfields used to be a school and post office as well. The session house was built in the late 1800s and was then moved to its current location at the third location. The last school year that was taught was in 1899. We can see on this map that in the 1800s, Hawfields was actually a school district too. Looks good. In the early days, people would ride the horse to church. My father told me he rode his to church. And at one time, this was my Sunday school room. And Miss Marion Covington was my teacher. That, now that's Bill and Benny's mother. And we heated it with a wood stove. And later on in, in my life, this was where the scout troop met. Scout I was master. a cub master and scout master back in the 70s and 80s. Uh -huh. And we met next door in the fellowship building. Much success in the early 1900s led to major investments like buildings and programs like the manse which was built in 1907. Youth group and Sunday school. The youth group actually used to have a bus which would pick up some 40 children every Sunday morning. The youth group just got back from Montreat, which is a high school youth conference. So here are some clips from that. Hey, Tolor.
1926, the Fleming Room was added on to the sanctuary. Mrs. Fleming taught the junior choir who sang every fourth Sabbath. The Fellowship Hall was built in 1951 to serve as a basketball court with one hoop and classrooms for students. This is a fe the Fellowship Building. It was built in the late 40s and completed in the early 50s. I was around 10 years old at that time. And I remember this big hole in the ground here for the basement of the building. There used to be brick walls in here. And we had a basketball goal up here. People come in here from all over the community, play basketball. And if my memory is true, no windows were ever broken. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. We first called it the gymnasium, but you know, the room out there. And we used that, uh, uh, we did, we did some roller skating in the basement. Mm -hmm. We'd open doors and come around through the hall and back. And you know, it wasn't that bad a uh, pattern actually. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then they played basketball uh, inside the building. Uh, none of this playground equipment, of course the uh, daycare wasn't there, the uh, shelter wasn't there. None of that was back, was so, there at that time. Not even the baseball field? No. Mm. Okay. That did was you, just. Did you ever play baseball? No. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't. I wasn't much on playing ball. Yeah. We, uh, uh, for the most part, people like me started about the seventh, eighth grade. Just started milking cows for somebody. Uh, I first milked for you know where Ralph Scott lived, mm -hmm. and the barn out there has been converted to a house. I milked cows in there for several years. And then I went up to, uh, you know, who John Kennery was, uh, the big old barn uh, back this way. I milked cows in there for a year or so. Mm -hmm. uh, he had he had a lot of cows. We milked about 80 cows in that long barn. You know, you start at one end and go work your way all the way mm -hmm. uh, down. I went off to school mm -hmm. from that. Uh, Right outside the fellowship hall used to be a pool. From what I understand, the health department may, uh, stopped us from using it because there was no circulation of water, no filter mm -hmm. system, or anything on it. It was just like a, a pool of water. That's all, all they had. Yeah. In 1952, the Boy Scout troop was established. This is Jimmy Covington getting his Eagle Scout. He was the first to get his Eagle Scout at Troop 52. In 1957, the North Carolina Synod would vote to integrate with the blacks. And now the blacks didn't have to sit at the top. They could choose to sit on the bottom as well. In 1965, the education building was erected. It serves as a building that holds offices, computers, and even more classrooms. Some more services the church has provided over the last years, the daycare center that was started by Ellen Lawrence and evidently proposed by my grandfather, Graham Smith. Here's what she has to say about that. My name is Ellen Lawrence, and um, I came here to the church because I was called to interview for the position of early childhood teacher for the new position of child care that had been uh, researched in the community. And it was researched by a committee that had been established by the elders of the church. And Mrs. Dottie Scott, Mrs. P.W. Scott, and Mr. Howard Neese were the main leaders of that group. Uh, Mrs. George Basin, Sr., and Mrs. Ruth Dixon was a community lady, uh, was on the committee. I think Mr. Buck Mebbin was also Billy Mebbin's dad. Um, Mr. Odell uh, Smith, who was a staunch member of the church. And that was in the summer or early summer of 1964. And I came because I had not graduated from the old woman's college, now UNCG, but had been in home economics and really had a desire to work with children. And was told by some other daycare people in the county that there was a position opening. So I came here to interview. I think there were other people, I know there were other people who interviewed. Um, Don Campbell was our pastor at that time, and uh, this was the summer of 64. The Boy Scouts of this church had, with the help of the adults that I just mentioned, had gone door to door all over this com end of the community of this whole end of the county, um, knocking door on door saying, do you want to have your child in a 
preschool and we were going to be just a half day program. Second year our enrollment blossomed and we were in Sunday school classes in the church and we were getting to need to spread out because we had 28 children the second year. And um, we brought in Miss Sarah Lawrence who became Miss Sarah Michael as the assisting teacher and together we worked in those positions of having those children and trying to do the best we could in teaching them. I had gone back to UNCG, our women's college, when I found a professor who would teach after hours classes in childhood development and early childhood. And so I drove in the afternoons to Greensboro several times a week to gain the extra information I needed in order to be able to teach. Uh, we had very little money and we were supported by the Presbytery Psalm and by donations of people in the church. Um, one thing that was donated was from the parents, not just their little bit of a payment that they paid as tuition, but they came and made refreshments. Whenever we needed some cookies or something, some milk or something for our snack, um, your mom and lots of other moms would come and their mamas and bring snacks. So we had a really good time with that, and I learned about a lot about the nice folks in Hawfield's Church. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Are you making a puzzle? No. no good. No, no. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Well, have a happy new year. You good to see you. Good job. Did y'all have fun at Christmas? Yeah. Uh, who came to see you? Yeah. Who Santa. came to see you? Mommy's here. Oh, she'll be here, uh-huh. Did you see Santa Claus? Yeah. 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 Good, yeah. For, good for you. Good for you. Another service was the Civitan Club. Here's what Harriet Covington has to say about this. My name's Harriet Covington. I've been a part of the church for uh, over 50 years. Some of the things I've done, worked in the women of the church, taught Sunday school, various other things, worked with the youth, lots of other things. Can you get into the Civitans and who started that, when it happened? Uh, Civitan was started in Hall Fields in 1965. So our club now is like, I think it's 52 years old. I hadn't figured that out, but I think that was what we did this year, celebrate our 52nd birthday. It started as an all-male club because at that time the international organization was all-male. And in 1974, the international convention they opted to open the membership to female members, anybody 18 years old and older of good character that wanted to be a part of the Civitan Club. This particular club did not become co-ed until uh, 1979, so they were about five years you know, after the international went. And I joined Civitan in January of 1980. So I've been in Civitan for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed being a part of it. Who started here? I'm not positive who started here. There are not many charter members left. There are one or two or three charter members. Bob Webster, the late Bob Webster, was a member. Um, there were several other people in the church that were members. But the only ones left that I know now are Johnny Williams, who's not a member of our church, um, Bill Tate, and Bill Covington. Okay, the baseball field was the first thing at the park. And they leased the land from the church. We're on a, on a lease. We pay $10 a year to the church for a lease. And every five years that lease is renegotiated by the session of the church to make sure that it's okay to redo it. And any improvements or anything we do, pretty much, if it's a structural change, we have to present that to the session. Like if we want to, you know, do something major there. The ball field was built in 75, and my husband Neil was on the ball field committee. They had different committees. He was on the ball field committee. And at the first, at the time, that was cornfield. I don't remember who the field belonged to or who was raising corn. It belonged to the church, but I'm not sure who was raising corn on the field. But anyway, it was cornfield. And I think maybe we had our first ball team 1976. We only had one ball team to start. And this was softball? It was baseball. And now we have baseball and softball and football. Hmm. So we've changed a lot through the years. But we started out with this at one team. And the community is welcome to walk around. And we even have places where you can exercise and do pull-ups and stuff.
The shelter was um, built in 1977, and the dedication took place in, on May the 15th of 1977. And there were four, five, or six people on that committee. I was not on that committee. The um, original building, which I have pictures that I'm going to show you, was pretty much like a open shelter. It had the high rafters at the top, the open rafters, and it was not closed in. It had a closed in kitchen and it did have a storage area. No bathroom, and that was it. We had bathrooms at the park for the ball field. We didn't have a bathroom there. And one long after that, after it was dedicated, people kept saying, well, it's a shame that this can't be used year round for for something. And Civic Town needed a place to meet because they had met at a restaurant over here that's on the other side right across from Love's truck stop now called Bryant Steakhouse. Been many, many moons ago. It's been gone. And they needed, that had closed and they needed a place to meet. And people said, kept saying, we have nowhere to do a family picnic or a family reunion or anything. And so the Civic Town began to think about how we could m make it more usable for year round. And so we closed it in and Later on, it still had the high ceilings and the high rafters. It was hard to heat, but we had some heat in there. We had put gas logs in the fireplace, and then we put some gas heat in. And then later on, we decided to lower the ceiling. So we, we lowered, lowered all that, and the civic tan did all the work. We had the lumber sawed at Sykes Saw Mill, which is over on, office, on Sykes Road, or was on Sykes Road at the time. And then the guys in the club did all the work and put it up. Through the years, we've done a lot of extra improvements to it. We recently just painted inside, painted inside, not all the paneling, but painted the bathroom doors and things. And we also put in a new heating system, and we got um, natural gas, so we can heat it, and and we have a good air conditioning system. So now it can be used year round by people in the community. So okay. it's come a long way mm -hmm. from being an open shelter. It's come a long way. The reason it has the name of Covington Shelter, it was built by the descendants of my husband's grandfather, his grandfather's two brothers, who all had lived in the community at one time. All of them were deceased at that point, but they had lived here. And the committee just started by writing a letter to all the descendants and, and raising the money. And that's how the first shelter was built, the first original. Since then, anything else that's been done, improvements and things, have been done by Hallfield Civitan. Uh, why did you put it down there? Was it donated land? Uh, no, it was just on part of the church land that was right. leased. And we already had that land that was leased and it was approved by the session. And these are patches from awards that we've won for doing various things. Mm -hmm. Like there's our Special Olympic patches. Mm -hmm. And that was our Honor Club patches. for all, You get to be Honor Club if you fulfill all the qualifications on there. Want my glasses off so I can see me? <laughs> The Presbyterian Homes was started by Miss Mary White Scott, who donated her land to the church. Max Cornell is the current boss at the Presbyterian Homes. Here's what he had to say. My name's Max H. Cornell, and I'm the administrator, and I've been here since 1984, in administration since 88, at the Presbyterian Home Office. When Miss Mary White Scott died in, I think, 1972, her will she put in some land to give to the church for a home for the aged. And she and Ralph Biggerstaff, I understand, actually had the original idea on a way to a funeral. And Miss and Ms., uh, Ms. Mary White Scott supplied the land. Her old home place was here. There's actually a picture out there and, and the original uh, chimney, some of the original bricks are in the dining room in there. And the bricks that came out of this chimney, I can show you. I don't know who, but I know James was involved. Actually, tore the bricks out and busted the stuff off of them and stored them. Miss Mary White Scott, just for information, was Bob Scott's mother, Governor Bob Scott's mother, and Governor Carr Scott's wife. But her old original, called the White Place, was right here on the property. And she felt uh, need to be a home for the aged in Hallfield. Gave it to Hallfield's Church. In 1973, a committee from Hallfield's Church had been set up to look at what to do with the land and after some uh, work, they, uh, and your grandfather was one of the original members, uh, they established um, the committee and then they incorporated into the Presbyterian Home of Hallfield, which is what it is today. 
It's an independent, not-for-profit corporation, uh, exclusively to run the nursing home. So it, that was started in 73. Back then, money was really tight, and it took about 10 years to get financing to start it. And it was started in 1983, opened in 1984, April of 84. And it was a loan from Farmers Home Administration. Uh, over the years, it's it's come to what it is. It's added on 16 more rooms, uh, or 32 more rooms, I guess it was, in uh, uh, 1994. Cottage and duplex were built. Miss Mary White Scott donated the land. Yes, she did. How many acres was that? Well, she donated 52 acres, and um, they're still on, the home is sitting on 13 acres. The actual home. The rest of it's the field. It's the farm down there. Do y'all use that in any way, or no? It's it's okay. no. It's not for. It's it's the farmer farms it. How large is the facility, and who owns the land now? The land that the facility sits on itself is still under the Presbyterian Home of Hawfields. Some of the other land has been sold. Some was acquired and has been sold. But um, the it's still owned by the not-for-profit corporation. This building. I can't remember, it's 83,000 square feet, I believe it is. There's probably 140 rooms in the building total, uh, but it's still uh, owned and operated by a not-for-profit corporation, Presbyterian Home Office. And a majority of the board members come from Hallfields Presbyterian Church in the agreement from um, between the church and to, to be sure that Miss Mary's wishes were honored. The church still has a majority of the board of directors. Are there church services here? Yes, lots, lots during the week, all kinds of activities. Uh, Hallfields Church has one uh, monthly, comes in on Sunday morning. Lots of stuff, and I can show you the activity calendar, but I, okay. there's something every day, except maybe Christmas doesn't have something because residents go out, but there are numerous activities every day, including Monday morning, big sing-along where everybody gets together. A lot of stuff for them to do, a lot of choices. A chapel was added in 1994, and um, some of the church services are held in the chapel. Some are held in the, in the lounge because of the convenience for most of the residents. And what other type of services are offered besides on the calendar and stuff like that? Well, some of the things that are done here for physically is like therapy. We have a therapy department, physical, occupational, speech therapy that's available in needs. And, and uh, so we've got a, a hall that is used exclusively for rehab people. People come in. Uh, get rehab and in a lot of cases go back home. That started three or four years ago that we we used one of the new wings over there. But really, it, it's simply to practice going up and down steps. I'm 66. You get to be our age. Going up and down steps is a big thing. Mm -hmm. the, the therapist, if you if you watch them, they'll say, "See what you're doing. You're you're stepping the wrong way." Yeah. You know, residents are encouraged to go to as many activities. I don't know how many it is. Probably two or three every day that are available for them. I don't remember, I believe it was about $180,000 was raised from Hallfields church members and donated to the home for the startup money. But Mr. Biggerstaff sort of supported it and carried it on till his death 10, 15 years ago. And your and your Aunt Beth Dunkley has been here since it, pretty soon after it opened in 1984. Who you stole her camera from? You gotta leave that on there. <laughs> Meg Scott Phipps is the grandchild to Miss Mary White Scott. She used to be the director of Christian education here. Her family was one of the most politically active families in Alamance County. They were progressive and as Meg says they were groovy. Here's what he had to say about that. Um, Meg Scott Phillips and um, uh, be 62 years old next month and I was born and raised in the Hallfields community. I've lived there most of my life until recently. Um, Rel Scott is my great uncle. Okay. Uh, he is. He was my dad's uncle. Um, and of course, they lived on Highway 119. One of my early memories there is um, on Sundays after church it used to be quite common that you went to someone's that your family went to someone's house for lunch and you and you would sort of stay the afternoon and sometime at we called him uncle ralph even though he was a great uncle mm -hmm. um sometimes we would go to uncle ralph and they would have as many as 30 people there for 
lot. Um, I really enjoyed um, being head of the Christian education um, at Hallfields Church, and it was, you know, there were just enough young people that it had to be one group, you know, not the junior and senior highs. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody had to be together. So that was a little difficult because, you know, middle school kids like different things than right. the high school kids. I did love um, planning the events and planning the Montreat retreats and um, doing those kind of things with uh, all the young people. My dad, Robert Scott, right, was... Lieutenant Governor from 1964 to 68, and then Governor from 1969 to 72. And that's why our family lived in Raleigh. I'll give you one history thing Mm -hmm. that that happened to us in the community. It would have been 1966 or 67, before Martin Luther King died. Mm -hmm. Um, But over on Cherry Lane, in the house that we grew up in, uh, we had a cross burned in our yard. By the KKK? Mm Mm-hmm. And I distinctly remember it, and we saw it. um, And it was on a Saturday night, because the next day we were leaving to go to camp at Camp New Hope. Now, I was getting research for this project. Bob Scott, Meg's father helped tremendously. He was working on the sequel to The Church in the Old Fields. Unfortunately, he passed away when he was working on this, but he did have a few cassette tapes of interviews and services that I found in his box of resources. So thank you, Bob, for everything you did for the church, and thank you for the resources such as this service of Carol Fisher right now. In 1944, Carol Fisher was the first female minister to be elected. Here is some of her voice. Our first lesson comes from the sixth chapter of the prophet Micah, beginning with the sixth verse. Listen for the word of God. Since the people here have so much wisdom, I decided to ask what they would say for advice. From a, from a nursing home standard uh, situation, I would, I would suggest to, to strongly plan for your future. Start at somebody as young as you to start planning for retirement. The big thing that's always been a part of what the Presbyterian Home does and what Office Church does is to care for others and to particularly care for those that don't have money or the funds to do things with. As it was established, the main goal was to take care of people in Hallfields, and still is. There are several members of Hallfields Church still in this that, are, that reside here. And a lot have been in here as residents, a lot of them for therapy and gone home. Um, basically, I think for most of us, we depend a lot upon the foundations of previous research and oftentimes through reading and that sort of thing, questions will arise and then hopefully we will then do primary research of our own to you know, expand the body of knowledge. And so that's a lot of the things that we do in terms of writing books and so forth here. I think volunteers are usually happier people because they give something of themselves. And you, know, you can give money or whatever but until you really give something of yourself and do something for somebody and touch somebody else's life, I think you miss a lot in life. And people that don't volunteer probably would disagree with me. They probably would say they having fun doing what they're doing. You know, they're going dancing or they're doing this and that and the other. But I still think you miss a lot in life if you don't... You're not in life by yourself. And I think you miss a lot if you don't reach out and touch somebody else's life. Be there. Show them that you care. That the church means something to you. That we need to keep that church there. Not particularly exactly as it is, but that church has history. Don't let it fly away. I'm probably not a person that ought to be given a lot of advice, but uh, I think uh, I think I would like to see more interest in this church as such. I hate to see it, 
uh, keep struggling to stay active. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, at some point uh, it will take a upward swing as far as uh, membership and that sort of thing uh, because certainly there's it's worth preserving uh, and uh, that would be the only thing I would hope for uh, as far as uh, this community and all is concerned. Mm -hmm. Perhaps our latest progressive decision was electing our first black minister, David Ely. He was elected in 2010 and he is still serving. The question we have to ask ourselves is, what does the future hold? But no one really knows. So what do we look towards? My favorite quote from Letter from Birmingham Jail by Martin Luther King Jr. goes like this. But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Every day I meet young people whose disappointment with the church has turned into outright disgust. This could have been written not just this century, but today. We now have to ask ourselves the question, how is the church going to continue? A statement written in the church's bulletin for years goes like this. This congregation seeks to demonstrate the relevance of the Christian faith. Since pioneer days, the people of Hawfield's church have not been afraid to forge ahead with new vision, new purpose, and changes that time brings. We invite our visitors to share with us in this undertaking. As a scout, the compass guides us through the wilderness and earthly matters. But as a Christian, the Holy Spirit guidance directs us through storms, peaks, valleys, and constant changes. Sometimes the only north we should look to is God himself. But now I'm just